Thank you. Please be seated. Wow. Thank you for that welcome, Ian. And uh, good to see some uh, friends from uh, the, uh, over the last few years. It's actually a year to the day that I was here. And you all remember what I preached on, don't you? Oh, thank you. That's, that's good. That's really good. I'm delighted by that one. Yeah, it's a, it's a year where all a year, all a year older. And uh, we were, Ian just mentioned it. I, I wasn't going to mention it, but we, we did, we started um, 42 years ago in our living room with 11 people. And in two years, there were eight of us. So it was, uh, it just <laughs> went like that. No, that, that's absolutely true. We, we hadn't a clue what we were doing. And, uh, and, then, and then God just started to do something and did something in us. And then the first baptism we had with 39 people baptized. So we looking back on it, it was a kind of a mini revival. And uh, I'm glad to say that a lot of those people are still with us today. So we're, we're, we're so grateful. Um, both grateful, the two of us, to be well and our health good and, and fit, etc. Although I had a horrible experience um, in Winnipeg in Canada. I was, we were over doing some meetings in America and Canada and uh, I was uh, speaking at a really large church in, in the middle of Winnipeg, and there's a Saturday night service, and we waited in the lobby of the hotel for somebody to pick us up, and this young lady came in, drove in, she said, she got out of the car, and she said, oh, I'm really sorry, I'm a bit late, but she said, I've only got a small car, and I had to get a bigger one. Wait for it, because I was worried about getting an elderly man into a small car. <laughs> So I'm looking, I'm looking round for the elderly man. And Priscilla's going, honestly, I was, it was a horrible experience, honestly. I haven't quite got over it, to be truthful with you. And I, I mean, I don't mind an older man, but please, not an elderly man. Anyway, I don't feel like an elderly man. Um, at the beginning of the year, when I was uh, just thinking about the year ahead, I felt one of those prompts of the Holy Spirit and felt the Lord say uh, to speak more about Jesus. So that's exactly what I'm going to do today. So uh, my, my topic is it's all about Jesus and it's based in Colossians chapter 2. So why don't we read from Colossians chapter 2 uh, verses 6 and uh, up to verse 12 or 13. So Paul says, and I'll, I'll, I'll need to dip in and out of other verses as well, but just to read this block. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it. It's kind of a warning, actually. See to it. In light of that, come on, watch out that nobody takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you've been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. I've been a Christian for over 50 years, and over, the, over those 50 years, I've seen many things come and go, uh, and, and actually many of them good, uh, and, and that have helped us in the church, etc., I think the danger was, as someone described it to me once, that we are in danger uh, at times of uh, suffering from something called disintegrated anticipation. Now, that's a made-up thing. And I'm going to explain it to you. And it means this, that there's a tendency at times to look for something that will come along that will solve all of our problems. There's something coming up in our life and in the life of the church, and, and we don't know what it is, but you know something, when it comes... It'll just solve everything. The problem is it isn't currently integrated into anything that we're doing, which actually undermines what we're doing. And over the last 50 years, I have seen so many things come and go. 
that have been, some of them good in themselves, but, but a number of them have just, have just gone. Let me read to you a few of them. Most of them you'll never have heard of, but I'm going to do it very quickly. Okay, wait for it. We've been memorized, Kansas City prophetized. We had March for Jesus, Center Healing. We had the Alpha Course, Willow Creek, Sensor Seeking, Spiritual Mapping, Toronto, Cell Church, Identification Repentance, Taking Your Cities for God, Pensacola, Early Morning Prayer, 24-7 Prayer, Youth Church, Transformation, New Rhythm, Celtic Christianity, The Intercessors, Revival is Coming, Deconstructionism, Spiritual Warfare, Unity is a per, uh, uh, Precursor to Revival, 24-7 Worship, and The Purpose Driven Church, and, men, and of course the National Lottery as well. And we, we, you know, so we're, we're looking for, I take it you didn't win last night or you wouldn't be here, I can, I can imagine. But you know, the point is simply that we're looking for something at times that will, I'm not singling them out because to be honest, I'm a great fan of Alpha. You know, we've seen hundreds of people come to Christ through Alpha. So the point I'm making is this. Are we pinning our hopes in something uh, uh, out there that we think that there are shortcuts that will help us live a life in Jesus Christ? What we're doing, does it make us more dependent or less dependent on Christ? Now, the interesting thing is that there were different issues, but the same thing was happening in, uh, in Colossae. The Christians were, were, not that they weren't Christians, because Paul's very clear about that. He says, in, he says uh, at, the, at verse 5, he says, I, I'm, uh, he says, although I am absent f- from you in the body, I am present with you in spirit. And here's what he says, and delight to see how delighted you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So it wasn't that they weren't Christians. They were, of course, but they were getting distracted. And they were putting their hopes and trust in something other than Christ who would lead them to a victorious life, a life of victory in Jesus, lead them to a shortcut to living a holy life. So the letter is a danger, written because these Christians were in danger of getting sidetracked. The issues which are later on in chapter 2 and chapter 3 are a little bit more serious than the ones that we face. But the point is simply this. If it leads us away from Christ, it becomes a distraction. And so this morning, I simply want us back, bring us back again to the person of Christ. And of course, right throughout our service, he has been the focal point of everything that we're doing, living in Christ. Thirteen times up to this point, Paul uses the expression, in him, in Christ. In verse 6, he says, they're, they're to continue to live in him. You started with Christ, now continue with Christ. You started with Christ, he's the only way to keep going. Now, why is Jesus Christ so vital, both in our salvation and in our Christian life? Because of who he is. If he were just a great man, or the smartest person that ever lived, or the richest our most famous person, that wouldn't be good enough. In fact, he was born into poverty and obscurity. But this is what it says of him. Peter, uh, Paul says these, these, these things twice. I'm going to go back to chapter 1 again. And he talks about Christ. He says, the Son, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile in himself all things, whether things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. He's saying, listen, you receive Christ in all his fullness. He contains all the fullness of God over every power and authority. He's the image of the invisible God. And he says, listen, this is what he did. He made peace between you and God. And the point is this, why would you go anywhere else? That's the issue. And if you go elsewhere, you find that package empty. So how do you do it? Well, let, let's, let's get in. I've just got, I've got four simple points. Verse 6, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord. There was a starting point when they were introduced to Jesus himself. Uh, it's interesting. You can call it whatever you want. I was taking a funeral uh, just before Christmas, and one of the, when we were discussing the arrangements, one of the family took me aside and said, will you be using the word saved 
in the funeral. And I said, well, I hadn't thought about it, but I definitely am now. <laughs> you never tell an Ulsterman not to do something. And there are many expressions uh, to, uh, to describe what that is, but you can say that I got saved. You can say I came to know Christ. You can say I to know I was converted. You, you can say I had a, I, there was a moment in my life when I, I received Jesus Christ, invited him into my life. Yeah, I, you can say I saw the light. You can say, in, and certainly in parts of Canada where, where we have been for going for many years, that when somebody becomes a Christian, they say they took their stand. That's the, that's the expression that they use. And so it doesn't really matter what you call it. The reality is you've got to personally know Christ Jesus as Lord. And that's a question I, that's what I want to ask today. Um, I, many years ago, Priscilla and I did a course called the Evangelism Explosion Course on the four spiritual laws. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it. But you, what you did was you just literally went up to strangers in the street and you, you asked them two questions to determine whether they were Christians. And if, they, if you determined that they weren't, you led them through a little prayer. So, you know, it, it sounded very simple. So I, 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 we were all sent out to do it. And I went, and it was the Donegal Road in Belfast. And I went up to this man. I said, sir, could I talk to you about, about Christianity? He says, okay. And I said, if you died, I mean, it, like there was no holding back. If you died tonight... And I'm a big guy, you know, I'm sort of, if you die tonight, mate, <laughs> would you be absolutely sure that you would go to heaven? And the man said to me, yes, I would. I said, great. I said, and then the, the next one is this, this is the killer. I said, but suppose you did die tonight and you stood before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And he said to me, because I played the organ in my church for the last 32 years. I went, uh -uh. <laughs> So the diagnostic question came like that. You see, you, you start with Christ and you begin a journey which lasts all of your lifetime and into eternity. And it doesn't matter what you call it, but I want to ask you today, have you received Christ Jesus as Lord? I was a broken young man, 16 and a half. The parents had just split up. I left, I was about to leave school. I didn't know what my life was going to be. And somebody cared enough about me, a great uncle, to invite me to a church. And I heard about Jesus. And I will never forget that day. I remember it. Some people can do this. The 25th of October, 1967, which is a different century away. It was the third row from the back, the eighth seat in. Ten to nine. The man was preaching on Romans 10 and 9. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And I said, I don't know, I don't know what this all means, but I'm, gonna, I'm just confessing Jesus is Lord, and I believe that God raised him from the dead. And you know something? That moment, at that moment, I passed what we say from death to life, from light to darkness, from fear to peace. Something happened. I had a moment when I met Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I have never, ever regretted it. It was incredible. Now, now, and I'll take you through a little. Today, it can be slightly different because I had what, what we call a, a, Damascus, a Damascus Road experience. There was a, did anybody here have a Damascus Road experience? Could I just see your hand? Yeah, there's a few of us around. We're, we're, the, we're the true Christians in this room today. <laughs> Uh, but of course, sometimes it's a bit different today because people go on a, they call it a spiritual journey. I've, 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 this is one that's been with me for years, but you know, whenever, whenever I was in my uh, years ago, we wanted people to behave themselves. And if they then believe what we believe, we might let them belong to our church. I'll do that again, okay. So we, wa we, we, we wanted people to behave themselves. And no, we didn't want any messy people. Sort your life out. Believe what we believe and we might let you join here. But Jesus flipped it in its head. Jesus got a group of men who belonged. He took them on a, I, he, he, he brought them into a group, 12 of them. They all didn't make it. So it wasn't that they were all, you know, believers. But he brought them into a group. And so they belonged. And he took them on a journey of believing and taught them how to become 
believers in God. A lot of people have that experience today. A lot of people walk through that. I call it an mess road experience, you know, where, you, where, where the, two on the, the road to a mess, where they walk with Jesus all day, and then I didn't recognize him. Then at the end of the day, they went, oh, he was there. Oh, he was there all the time. There you go. So there's, there's something very powerful about that. I think Alpha has been the, 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 uh, the practical outworking of this, where Alpha is a, a Christian, a course of 10 weeks that explores Christianity, and you get into groups and you discuss a, a short talk and you have food together. And uh, I'm, I'm, we're running one at the Milton Sunday night on a sports person's Alpha. It's been absolutely fantastic. And um, uh, you, you, what you find with Alpha is that people go on a journey. Let me give you a, a, an example of George. George was a, a uh, his daughter had, uh, had arrived at her church, given her life to Christ, and he wanted to find out what was going on. He wasn't very happy, and, and he, he came to Alpha. And after the second week, he said, um, you know, I found a group of people to whom I belong. And he went right through a 10-week Alpha course, and you know what happened? He didn't become a Christian. That's true. And he said to me, Paul, could I, he was an atheist, he said, could I come back and do another course? I said, certainly. And he said this to me, could I be a helper? I said, well, George, you're an atheist. It's kind of, we usually, we usually, you know, when you're trying to promote Christianity, it really, it, it's, I don't know if that would work. He said, I'm bringing four friends. I went, okay, you can't. That's fine. <laughs> And he, he, he was our first atheist helper in Alpha. Must be a, a, but honestly, he was so enthusiastic, you know. And he kept saying to us, you need to, be, you need to trust Jesus. You guys need to get saved. I was like, what is going on here? But of course, God was working in his heart and in his life. He was on this incredible journey. And of, course, and of course, he goes through the second Alpha. Guess what happened? He said, no, I'm still not a Christian. But the four friends all got saved. Come on. What's that all about? It's the most bizarre thing. Now, eventually, you know, I, I, I used, he was a great one for metaphors as I am. And he said, I said, well, George, are you on the bus? He said, I bought the ticket and I'm on the bus. And I said, when did that happen? He said, I'm not quite sure. And that's okay. That's okay. But I, I want to ask you, every single person, whether you have been on that journey, and you can't look back to a moment the way I could, but I want to ask you this morning, can you say with confidence, I've received Christ Jesus as Lord? One final story. When you get old, when, you get, when you're young, it's 10 points, one story. When you're old, 10 stories, one point. That's it. That's okay. Life experience. I did a, I did a, a, a Good Friday. I was on, called, asked to go on the radio in, uh, in Belfast. Uh, to talk about um, Good Friday. And the, 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 the lady who was, it was a kind of a you know, music chat program, and you know, she had me on, Pastor Reed, and she said, could you tell us why Jesus died? And then she answered her own question. She said, well, it's because he loved us, wasn't it? And I said, yeah, yes, definitely. A wee bit more to it than that. She said, well, well explain it to me. And I said, well, suppose, let's, let's bring it into Aberdeen, although I used, I used the, the lagging. Suppose a, a couple, young couple are walking down uh, the banks of the day and they're in love and they're looking into each other's face and they both say, I love you. And suddenly the young man says, I love you so much, I'm gonna jump into the day and drown myself. <laughs> it wouldn't be very loving, would it? But here's the point. Suppose that the love of his life was in the day and drowning. And he jumped in to save her. And in the process of saving her life, he lost his own life. That would be loving, wouldn't it? You see, that's the issue. We're in the river. We're perishing. We are drowning. We are lost. And that's why we need the creator of the whole world, to be our savior. He gives himself because you and I are lost. And that's why we need to receive Christ Jesus as Lord. Before this meeting's over, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. The second thing that he says in the verse, same, the same, uh, just the, the second verse, he says, having received Christ Jesus, Lord, be rooted and strengthened and built up in the faith. You see, the gospel isn't just a door that you walk through. It's a house that you live in. 
Your roots, so what he's saying is this. Listen, you started with Christ. Your roots are in him. Now, now, now live in him. Be like a, it's like a plant. You draw nourishment from him. They, they needed to keep building with solid materials and their faith would be strengthened. He says, he says I, I'm not going to go into it, but it, it would keep them from hollow and deceptive philosophies. It would be about having a, a living, intimate, vital connection with Jesus Christ on a daily basis. Christianity is not a mental assent to several words or even saying a prayer. It is that having started there, you begin your life in Christ and you begin to grow with him and you begin to develop a relationship with him. I, did, I didn't know an awful lot about Jesus when it started. That's why in Christianity, there, there are, in the Bible, there are three tenses to salvation. There's, there's past, present, and future. So I can look back and say, over 50 years ago, as a young lad of 16, 67, 1967, I received Christ Jesus as Lord. And honestly, I, my, but that moment that happened, my salvation was secure, my sins were forgiven, and Christ became my Lord and Savior. But I've spent the last 53 years finding out what it's like to be a Christian. And that's what it is. You go on this journey. So we are saved. We are being saved in the sense that we are growing into what God has called us to. How do you do that? You're in Christ and you develop a relationship with Christ. And that's the most important thing. And then, of course, ultimately, we will be saved because, because salvation to be complete will give us a new body. It's always in the New Testament. It includes that. So there's a day coming when it says in Hebrews, Christ will come, will appear, not to bring salvation, oh, sorry, uh, uh, not to die, but actually to bring salvation. And, and in other words, we will be transformed and be change. So the three tenses to it. So how do you do it? Well, you live in Christ. You have a daily routine. You have a relationship with Christ. I, you, we used to call it all sorts of things. We used to call it the quiet time. Priscilla and I have a quiet time. We are we're the sort of people, we, we do it in the same place, the same seats. We're boring, we're old, but it works for us. Although I do, I, and I, you, you might have heard me say this, but you know, we did, I did realize that what it looks like for Priscilla and what it looks like for me are totally different. Completely different. Because she's a different person to me. She's, she's beautiful. She's, she's beautiful. No, she's beautiful and she's spiritual. And, and uh, anyway, when we first got married, leave that aside. When we first got married, we decided that we would take one night a week and we would pray together. We didn't have a television. We were, we were hardcore. And uh, we said we'd pray together for about two or three hours. And it lasted for two weeks. Because she said my prayers were short and superficial. And I said hers were long and boring. Simple as that. And I, I, Priscilla is, is a, she has about 10 times the vocabulary as me. She is a, she's written a, a poetry book. And they're, they're absolutely wonderful. You follow us on Facebook. You can get a copy at Paul Reed, uh, paulpriscillareed.com. Okay, 10 pounds, no problem. Anyway, <laughs> be a bit of product there. So Priscilla, Priscilla's go, and she's sitting here. So you'll, you'll, you'll have heard her last day. Here's the way Priscilla goes, Lord. She started praying. She goes, Lord, passionate. Lord Jesus, I thank you that I met Janet at the school gates yesterday at three o'clock. <laughs> oh no, I think it might have been ten past three actually. <laughs> because my dad had actually phoned up and, uh, and he hasn't been too well lately, you know. That trouble with his leg that he got when he was 17, it's come up again. And uh, the doctor, he's a new doctor, he's lovely Scottish actually. <laughs> I'm going, I, oh, I'm praying this. Please, Lord, make it stop. <laughs> it's, now, now, it's not a male-female thing, but do you, do you find out there are people that, and there's nothing wrong with story prayers, but just don't pray them in front of me. Okay? <laughs> just say, I have, a, we, I have an imaginary remote control. This is true. <laughs> And when Priscilla starts talking to him, did I just go, fast forward, wine, get to the point here, come on. And it's just, my point is simply this, that we express, the way we express our life in Christ looks different. Here's, here's my point to you, find something that works for you, okay? I don't want to be prescriptive, I have a notebook, I, I have a journal, I have a, the Bible, I use a commentary, and I just do my own commentaries. There, I have hundreds of sermons that nobody will ever hear, unless somebody wants to 
transcribe them and sell them and make a fortune of them. <laughs> but probably, probably that's not going to happen, okay. But the, 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 and, and it simply is, it's living in Christ. It's, it's, and I, I suppose having, when I look back on my life, I think, what, what was the thing that has uh, nurtured me on? Was it, was it, um, you know, was it all the stuff that, that I got involved in? It wasn't, it was my, my walk with Jesus Christ. Most things, most change doesn't happen in a day, but by what you do daily. And you live in Christ, and you draw roots from Him, and you talk to Him, and you tell Him that you love Him, and you tell Him that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that is the Savior of your life. Paul says here, and be thankful. And every day you wake up and you say, Lord, I want to thank you for what you did for me. I want to thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for me. I want to thank you that he loves me and he's transforming me on a daily basis in the sense that I give myself to him and I become more morally and, and, uh, like Christ. So there, there's, there's something very powerful about that. He's not a concept. It's not just information. It's this incredible sense of Jesus changing our lives from within. I, I, I suppose a, a number, uh, just on, on a, to finish this point, um, I, I, uh, I, without sort of getting into all the details, uh, Homer's Iliad, okay, and this is, now we're getting spooky, okay, but it's, it's uh, Greek mythology. There's, there's a great story uh, about uh, the Sirens. The Sirens were a group of people Probably, it, he, Homer said they were female, and they sang the most beautiful songs. And what they did was they drew men onto the rocks. They were mythical creatures. And so there are two stories of how they were handled. One of them was by um, Odysseus. When he was coming back from the Trojan Wars, he knew he had to go back uh, past the Sirens. And, and uh, so what he did was, knowing the temptation, he poured beeswax into his men's ears and got them to lash him to the mast. So that, that, so that they, you can read it in Homer, so that they couldn't be drawn onto the rocks. And so when he heard the singing, he commanded his men to let him go, but they, were, they couldn't hear because they'd beeswax in their ears. And they got past safely. When Jason came, do you have heard of Jason and the Argonauts? It was an old Hollywood movie years ago. When Jason was going by, what he did was something different. He brought Orpheus with him, the most noted singer and poet in the land. And when they were sailing past the sirens, he said to Orpheus, Orpheus, play a sweeter sound. And when Orpheus began to sing, the men were so enchanted by it that they weren't drawn onto the rocks. Here's my point, and that is this, that unless Jesus becomes a sweeter song to you in all the pool of this world, you can even pour beeswax in your ears, but it won't work. Ultimately, you have to be entranced and enchanted and captivated by the beauty of Jesus. You've got to, you've got, thank you. You've got to, you've got to say, he is worth everything. And the third point, very simply, is this, as I, as I kind of draw it to a close, and it means accepting Christ Jesus as Lord. Now, I, I'm, I'm separating these for emphasis not because they should be separated. Because when you accept Christ Jesus, you actually accept him as your Lord. It's not a concept that we're familiar with. The idea of the, the laird in Scotland, of course, the idea of the, the head of the clan. But of course, when it comes to lordship in the New Testament and with Jesus, it's the idea that it's about control. It's about the person who, who um, has the ultimate say in your life. Uh, and, and you think, well, why, why would I hand over control of my life? So Christianity begins with, with that receiving Christ Jesus as Lord, that moment in your life, be it a journey or a moment in time when Christ became your Savior. And then you, you, you are fulfilled and you become more like Christ as you live your life in Christ, as, you, as, as he becomes more precious to you, as you, you feed on him and develop your relationship with him. But ultimately, of course, he is Lord of our lives. And it's really important. And the reason I separate it is because not that it should be separated, but I want to really challenge that today because I, I think that when you come to Scripture uh, with a pick and mix attitude, 
In other words, I'll take a bit of this and a bit of that. It actually doesn't work. Christianity is a terrible hobby. It's a terrible hobby. It only works when you're full on and you've handed over control of your life to Jesus. And I think sometimes you can have a moment of that. I certainly did because in my, my young day, it was, took me a while to, to realize that was what it was about. It wasn't about what I wanted to do. It wasn't that he was helping me with my agenda. It wasn't that he would make my life easier. Because they all, ultimately, you know, who cares what my, if my life is easy or not if Jesus isn't my Lord? This was the most important thing. And I had a moment in my life. Again, I was probably about 17. And I realized that and I said, Lord, I don't exactly know what this means. And I know I'll have to work it out every day. But from this day on, I am going to declare that I have received Christ Jesus as Lord. I think if Christianity is only as deep as another helpful product, then ultimately, ultimately that product will fail you. Allegiance to something that makes your life easier to manage shouldn't be confused with genuine conversion, which has as its heart surrender to the Creator God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've got to be really careful. Looking at it, I could say to you, Today, and this would be a lie, all your problems are over when you receive Christ Jesus as Lord. Now, looking at it from eternity, it'll be obvious that it works to be honest, unselfish, chaste, and humble. But in the short term, if you decide not to sleep with your boyfriend, you may remain single for a longer time than you anticipated. If, you, if you're honest in your work, you may be denied a promotion, or even lose your job. Practicing honesty may be an impediment to career advancement. The gospel does say that, that through it you find your life, but actually first you lose your life. And so I say to you today, Christ will work for you. Only if you're true to him, whether he works for you or not. You mustn't come to, you mustn't come to him because he's fulfilling, although he is but you come to him because he is the Lord of the universe. To become a Christian is not to get help for your agenda, but to take on a whole new agenda, the agenda of the kingdom of God. And it means this, that Jesus Christ is Lord. You must obey him because you owe him your life, because he is your creator and your redeemer. I want to confront you with the most pragmatic issue of all, the claim of Jesus to be absolute Lord of life. And today, I want to give you the opportunity to say, you know something? I want to make Jesus my Lord. I want to make him my Savior, but also my Lord. They come together. And finally, the little boy in a meeting his dad said, the preacher kept saying, and finally, and he said to his dad, what does that mean? And his dad said, absolutely nothing, son. I've got one point more, and it's simply this. How do you do it on your own? Well, of course, you, you experience the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Paul actually doesn't, doesn't specifically mention the Spirit here, but he, he, talks, he says this here in uh, verse one, or chapter one, rather. He said in 28, he is the one we proclaim, talking about Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy, with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Because when you declare Christ Jesus as Lord and you receive him, he gives you a power and begins to work in you to enable you to change, to do what God is, want, wants you to do. It's like the pilot of a ship. They, it's all done digitally today, but in the old days in, in uh, Belfast Lock, when the ships were coming up, a, uh, a tug and the pilot would jump, would get onto the ship. The, the pilot would get onto the ship. And uh, I heard it in a program once, and the, the, the interviewer said to him, well, when you get onto that ship, you know the way. If, it's, if, the, if the pilot's never been that way before, why don't you just take the steering wheel? He says, no, no, we never do that there. He says, I just tell him where to go. And as long as he follows my instructions, he'll be perfectly safe. 
That's the way it works with God. Paul, earnestly contending, he gave his best. What happened? The Holy Spirit came alongside and empowered him to become the person that God wanted him to be. And so, so today, what, what a Savior Jesus is. How incredible is he? And today, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you, you know, and say this here. In light of my earlier story, and it's this, that we're drowning and we're lost and we're perishing. Have you received Christ Jesus as Lord? If you haven't, you might want to say something like this. Could we all say it together? Everybody. Some will have said it many times, but some of you, it'll be the time you go, you know something? I want to accept and receive Jesus Christ as Lord. Let's pray together after me. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Jesus, thank you for loving me. I was lost, but you rescued me. I was lost, but you rescued me. You gave yourself that I might live. You gave yourself that I might live. And I want to receive Christ Jesus as Lord today. And I want to receive Christ Jesus as Lord today. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if your life, even as a Christian now, is basically saying, you know something, Jesus isn't Lord of my life. Could this be the day when you say, actually, you know something, I think I am a Christian, but I've never made that commitment that everything I do will come under the Lordship of Jesus. Would you do that today? Would you pray something like this? You don't need to pray it. Lord Jesus, thank you that you saved me. I want to make you Lord of my life today. I want to say, Lord, it actually doesn't matter what my preferences are. It's about what you think. I receive you and accept you as Lord. Thank you. If you've prayed either of those prayers, would you slip your hand up and give me a chance just to pray for you? This isn't for me, but just to, just to, to, to give a, a, an opening and just say, I did that today. I said that prayer. I said that prayer. I said either of them. Would you put your, slip your hand up somewhere? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, for those who, who put their hand up, we've got a, a next steps uh, stall out in the foyer. Please go there or come up and talk to us. We'd love to pray for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy and grace. Thank you, Father, that we believe in a Savior who died for us and loved us so much that he gave his life for us. We want to live our lives rooted and strengthened in him. Lord, it's all about you. It's all about Jesus. Thank you.